Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this rainy evening for our Millennium Stage performance. We're so happy to have you. Tonight's performance is a part of the Broadway Tomorrow series, brought to you in collaboration with the American Society of Authors, Composers, and Publishers. I said those out of order. It's composers, authors, and publishers. <laughs> and here to introduce the performance tonight is the director of musical theater at the ASCAP Foundation, Michael Kirker. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, ASCAP, of course, is the songwriters organization that represents the finest of American songwriters in all genres of music, pop, rock, urban, country, you know, symphonic. Uh, but this series here at the Kennedy Center, uh, we're presenting the great uh, contemporary young songwriters of the musical theater. Uh, and as a musical theater person and ASCAP, I get to work with such iconic songwriters as Stephen Sondheim, Stephen Schwartz, Lynn Aaron, Steve Flaherty, Janine Tesori. Uh, but this series, as I said, is really about the contemporary writers for the theater. Uh, those of you who've been here in the past have heard early work by writers who've gone on to write such hit musicals as Junie B. Jones, A Christmas Story, uh, Murder for Two, uh, and Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, which is actually coming to the Kennedy Center, I think, in January. Uh, tonight you'll be meeting uh, a really terrifically talented contemporary writer for musical theater. His first musical, The Story of Life, uh, debuted on Broadway and has since gone on to be produced uh, internationally. Uh, his most recent musical, The Theory of Relativity, uh, was produced in London and in a hugely successful engagement at the Goodspeed Opera House in Connecticut. He's currently working on adapta an adaptation of the Disney film Bed Knobs and Broomsticks for the stage. Please welcome Neil Bottrom. Good evening, Dr. O'Hara. I'm glad you could make it. I, I know it's frustrating getting to Midtown at this time of day. The Uptown and R is a pain. Not to mention the rain, but thank you for coming, sir. I've got something to say. I'm allergic to cats. Well, that's part of the reason I asked to have dinner with you. I'm allergic to cats. I know it's hardly a life-threatening medical hullabaloo. See, when I was born, they expected me later, so I spent two months in an incubator. And ever since that, I can't be near a cat. I can tell by your smirk. You think this is silly and borderline phobic, perhaps. But this innocent quirk could cause such a violent reaction, my lung could collapse. So bear with me, sir, this is nothing sordid. Your patience, I promise, will be rewarded. I'm really not bats, just allergic to cats. But Julie, Julie loves cats. As you know, they're her passion and joy. She knits them wool sweaters and crochets them hats. For their birthdays, she sews them their own special toy. There's Meowser, Miss Mew, Cookie Puss, Alexander. Her couch is a playground of pee and dander. So I cough and I wheeze, pop a fistful of Claritin D's, try to hide before anyone sees. I'm allergic to cats. For over a year, I've hidden from Julie each anaphylactic display. Because she's such a dear. If she knew how cats make me suffer, she'd give them away. But she is my world. I live for her truly. Julie loves cats. And I love Julie. So she tickles their toes, and I smile as my throat starts to close, but I vow that she'll never suppose I'm allergic to cats. Well, Dr. O'Hara, I fear that I buried the headline. The point of this story is murky, I have to concede. I hope that I've shown you tonight I love your daughter with all of my might. So 
humbly I stand, asking you for her marital hand. Wedded life will be blissful and grand. With Julie and Meowser, Miss Mew, Cookie Puss, Alexander, the Dander, the Pea, and me. Gretchen! Thank you. Listen, I really want to thank the Kennedy Center for being such incredible hosts. They do this thing every day, and it works like a well-oiled machine, but, boy, they do a great job of making all of us feel like we are the most special people in the world, super well taken care of. And Michael Kirker, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this great series that ASCAP is doing, um, highlighting Broadway writing. And... Um, I think my favorite part about being a songwriter is telling stories, and I think it's uh, such a human thing to want to sit in rooms and hear stories and tell stories. I think back to cavemen and early theater, that's what we all want, and I, I think even in the, a world full of lots of modern technologies and new ways of communicating, I still have hope that that's what we all internally want, is the need to sit in dark rooms and hear stories being told. And I, if there's a theme for tonight's little concert, I think it's, it's, the, it's stories told through music, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, Michael mentioned a show called The Theory of Relativity, which was a, a, essentially a song cycle built around the stories of college and university students that were told to myself and my collaborator, Brian Hill. And um, we wove that into this show. That first song, I'm Allergic to Cats, came out of that. Uh, th those stories from college students and this next uh, song that I'm going to sing is also from that same show. So you're cruising along at college first semester winding down and you're finally over first semester shock now the holidays are approaching, so it's back to your old town, back to solid ground, your family, your rock. Yeah, there's nothing like heading homeward to clear the mental fog. The photographs in your memory never blur. So you're thinking about your parents, your sister Beth, and Spike, your dog. They're frozen in your head the way they were. Cause there's a footprint you left there Indelible and deep It's the core of your identity The principles you keep Your footprint, your history It's who you are So you run to hug your parents And Beth calls you a geek And when you yell for Spike Your dad says Son, we had to put him down last week So you find yourself back at college, kind of shaken, but okay. And you're quickly swept up again by freshman year. There's your roommate who hogs the bathroom, a new paper due each day. And your part-time job as a campus store cashier. Then it's suddenly spring vacation, and it's home you go once more. It's hard to believe the months have come and gone. You see that familiar driveway and you open that front door With the overwhelming feeling coming on That there's a footprint you left here, permanent and real It's your constant, your anchor, unbendable like steel Your footprint, your history, it's who you are And the place looks so inviting, it's everything you'd hoped you ask, where's my sister? Your mom says, dear, Beth and her boyfriend eloped. You'd like to think you're enlightened. You'd like to believe that you're flexible and cool. Sure, things will change while you're away at school. But you worry the foundation you've been rooted to so long is somehow less dependable. Is suddenly less strong At least you're not like a tadpole One of 3,000 eggs his mom unloads Who never gets to know his parent toads Yeah, at least you're not like that No, you still got your footprint on that threadbare welcome mat And a place
place to hang your hat So your life hums along at college And your worries slowly dim Opportunities to go home become more rare You hear your mom has a brand new hairdo And your bedroom's now a gym Your dad bought a vintage Chevrolet Bel Air Then your sophomore and junior classes Disappear before your eyes And you're thinking about a life beyond these doors Your old roommate is now your best friend Your latest paper won a prize You now manage all the college campus stores Still there's a footprint you cling to It's something you can't shake A bond that will not diminish A knee that will not break Your footprint, your history It's who you are And home's a place of comfort Where nothing's ever forced And over dinner with your parents They tell you they're getting divorced Then you have a calm revelation There as your world seems to blow up in your face You see that footprints don't belong in just one place They're in the life you've led But they're not firmly rooted They will multiply and spread On the path that lies ahead Yes, your footprint goes with you It's something you don't lose From the family you were born with To the family that you choose Your footprint, your history It's who you are And the universe gets larger And the cosmos will expand But one thing never changes Your footprint is right where you stand. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring out a friend of mine now. Um, this is my frequent, if not exclusive, collaborator. He writes the books, book to all the musicals I've written the music and lyrics for. Um, his name is Brian Hill. Please welcome him to the stage. Hey, Brian. What a handsome devil. <laughs> I'm your it's been lonely out, out here. <laughs> I missed you back there. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions. You okay with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, you write musicals, right? Yes. Um, so that must mean you grew up with musicals. You've loved them ever since you were a little kid and, and lived with them forever. Yes? No. Okay. I, um, I didn't. I didn't listen to musicals at all when I was growing up. I listened to pop music. I was listening to things like... Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight. That was, that was the kind of music I wanted to be Billy Joel, essentially. But that job was taken. So what happened? <laughs> um, um, I, I, you know, I, I started writing songs. I loved writing songs. And I would write songs that I like that, which I thought was a great song. And, and people would say, your songs are too theatrical. And so I started to realize that pop music, successful pop music, was was more... Like people, it's, they're vague, and people apply your own story to them. That, that what, that's what makes them great. But with um, musical theater writing, they need to be very specific and very related to a story. And that was the kind of thing I liked. And so, perfect segue. Speaking of stories, there was a show on in 2009 written by you and me called "The Story of My Life" on the Broadway. And I think we're going to sing a little something from that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Way to shut me down, good. by the way. <laughs> what, you, you, <laughs> you're like you're rambling, Neil. <laughs> you have more to say? No, I'm good. Let's do it. I like it here The waitresses tend to be rude But the food is so good The last time I ate here My publisher paid she should, what with all that my stories have made I had the lamb with the mint marinade I like it here It's comfortable The 
Two of us sitting and chatting and sharing some wine And some hummus The prices they charge here are really a crime We even pay extra for water with lime Still I come back again time after time I like it here You're probably wondering why we are here When there's so much to plan like that thing with your father But I needed you to myself for an hour tonight You see, everything's moving so quickly There's all these decisions to make And I still have my deadline My head is spinning and something just doesn't feel right I guess what I'm trying to say now that we have a minute is lately you're asking for more than I'm able to give I think you deserve more than someone whose heart isn't in it Instead of us picking out dishes and bedding I wonder if we shouldn't postpone the wedding Anne? What do you think, Anne? Are you okay? You haven't had more than a bite of your tuna tartare or the hummus. Look, all that I'm asking is can't we just wait and put on the brakes if it isn't too late? Give me some time, Anne, and that would be great for everyone. Just when two people get into a groove There's always this pressure that things have to move Why do relationships have to improve? I like it here Thank you very much. Uh, here's another question for you. What other stories are you working on these days? Well, as you may know, we are working on an adaptation of um, Ray Bradbury's classic novel, Something Wicked This Way Comes. And we're turning that into a musical, which has been an incredible, amazing journey. We got to speak with Ray Bradbury before he passed away. Um, Love the idea of this becoming a musical, so we're, we're deep at work at that. We had an incredible time at Penn State working with students, um, incredible students working on that this summer. And uh, we also did a reading at the Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle, so we have high hopes for that show. It's been tons of fun to work on. And we're going to do a song from it, right? So we, we are. Yeah, go. Talk, talk uh, uh, something Wicked This Way Comes is about two 13-year-old boys in uh, Dust Bowl, Depression, Middle America, and they thwart an evil carnival that happens to come to town. We're going to be playing the two 13-year-old boys at the top of this. And then it's going to sort of morph into a song that's later in the show where Brian will play the owner of the carnival uh, welcoming the town to the evil carnival. Um, you all set? I think so. We're two boys in a tree here. Looking in someone's window. <laughs> this is bad, Jim. Oh, man. This ain't right. Would you be quiet? Staring in a stranger's window from a tree at night. They're cool enough to leave the shade up. Come on down, Jim. They're kissing. Come with me. Grown up kissing. These are people doing private things that we ain't supposed to see. Whoa! I swear that this kind of thing will kill you, Jim. Maybe not soon, but someday you're gonna leap into trouble so deep you'll drown. So, Jim, come down. Grow up, Will. You're so naive. While you've been squawking, I've been learning things that you wouldn't believe. Jim, come down. Grow up, Will. Use your eyes Sometimes adventure is a thing that's dressed in another disguise I swear if somebody it's sees okay. we're in for it Worry too can't much Can't you just let it go now? I don't intend to simply sit till I'm old enough to quit this town Jim, come down Don't make me give up living and come back down to earth Jim, Once you see the world, you just can't look away Jim, come the down The view from here is enticing And I'd run there if I could 
Instead, I'm stuck here with time to kill, but soon, dang it, will. I'm leaving here for good. Yeah, well, chill then, Jim, you're stuck with me, I guess. And you're making me late as usual. And just like all of them fools just following rules. Well, if you had a dad, Jim, you could disobey. Come on, this is life great huge. Don't be daddy's little stooge and clown. That ain't fair. Jim, come down. Grow up, Will. Jim, come down. Grow up, Will. Jim, come Grow down. down. We are in a depression, folks, there's no denying. And I hear you crying out for respite from your dishwater gray existence. Life can be miserable, life can be dull. A sense of malaise just decays in your skull. Maybe you're weak, disadvantaged, or fat. Well, don't be silly. A carnival can't help you with that. But what we do is we conjure a simpler you. Today is mundane, make today disappear. We all want to be elsewhere, and elsewhere is just through these gates. Enter a place where your dreams come to life before you. Come meet the version of you that you're aching to be. She's there on the Ferris wheel spinning delirious inches from touching the sky He's shooting for prizes so focused and serious with the aim of a younger man's eye Visit a moment to come or a day long ago Here at Cougar and Dart, pandemonium shadow show What is a carnival without its very lifeblood? Fortunes, sad casualties Around every corner inside each tent you'll find them My wondrous menagerie freed from the clutches of time Here's Eliza, elastic, whose limbs are like gelatin Twisting her body in knots in here is the creature who's known as the skeleton Watch as his ancient flesh rots Life's rich with mystery, not like the life you all know Here at Cougar and Dart's pandemonium shadow show A carnival's more than its sun-bleached canvas and threadbare flags It's Ticket takers in worn out rags. A carnival barker can spout his spiels, but he can't come close to the way it feels to see like a child again, bound like a pup. A town full of sleepwalkers finally woke up from their daily days. Dark and cougar, we have our ways, you see. So eat candied apples and play all the games you want to. But the real game's afoot just as soon as you pass through our gate. Sounds and aromas, attractions revolving, casting a dizzying spell. You'll find all your meaningless worries dissolving as the lights of the carnival swell. Thrills and surprises meet row after fantastic row. Here at Cougar and Dart Pandemonium Shadow Show Question Have you ever had the privilege of working in the D.C. area, Mr. Bartram? Answer, yes About two years ago we did a show at the Signature Theater in Arlington and had a great time It was called Spin It was based on a Korean movie. We were asked to adapt a Korean movie into an American-style musical, and um, it was awesome. We had a, the best time here, the best talent in D.C. It's such a great theater town, and really smart, great audiences as well. We, we had a ball, didn't we? And Eric Schaefer at the Signature Theater is a great guy to work with. We just had a ball, didn't we? we really did. fantastic cast. Do something. And I'm going to do a song from that show. A moment comes, a moment flies There's nothing to pin it on It disappears before your eyes 
as fast as it came. It's gone. So moments pass, get intertwined. You try to hold them in your mind. You need a way to make the moment stay. A smile from yesterday, frozen the way they were. No one leaves or slips away. These memories never blur. You save each scar and every joy, like fireflies captured in a jar. You hold them down. Such a simple. Click. You can analyze your history, every stumble, every climb. You can search for hidden meanings that you missed. So you sift through every moment that you wrestled out of time. But a photo. Is just a photograph. It isn't warmth. It isn't fear. It isn't feeling or emotion or the aching of a tear. It isn't hope. It isn't love. It isn't life. It's just a click. So moments come and moments pass. Suddenly something's clear. You can save the moments under glass, or inhabit them while they're here. The lesson now for you and me is don't just look, but really see. Enjoy the ride. The journey's much too quick. Click. Click. Thank you. Do you have any more songs from Story of My Life? I think we do. We have Let's a couple do. more songs from The Story of My Life. This uh, show was on Broadway, starred <laughs> Will Chase and Malcolm Getz. Those guys were awesome. But Brian's awesome, too. Uh, it's a crazy backpedal. In a far-off land, there lived a beautiful butterfly. In a kingdom full of blossom-covered trees. Winding through this paradise, a river danced along and played with the constant summer breeze. The butterfly found a tiny branch at the riverside and watched the water rushing who knows where. Carefully he sheltered from the power of the breeze for surely it could toss him through the air. I am a butterfly, he said, trivial and small. And in the greater scheme of things, I don't mean much at all. So I flap my wings to stretch myself and just enjoy the view. I'm a butterfly, what more can I do? Afternoon, the butterfly asked the river, Madam, what makes you hurry so? What splendid destination are you rippling toward? Where, oh, where do you go? The river 
Peter said, I'm headed for the ocean. And the summer breeze inspires me to race. My friend, you'd love the ocean. It's remarkable to see. Won't you join our friendly chase? I'm a butterfly, he said, trivial and small. And in the greater scheme of things, I don't mean much at all. So I'll flap my wings to stretch myself and just enjoy the view. I'm a butterfly, what more can I do? And the butterfly, he dreamed of the ocean. He longed to flutter high above the seas. But there are dangers in the sky for a tiny butterfly. So from his branch he asked a question of the breeze. What makes you chase the river toward the ocean? And the breeze told him a most amazing thing. I'm simply made up of the currents in the air that start from the movement of your wing. Your tiny wing, you're a butterfly, my friend, powerful and strong. And I'm grateful for the way you've always hurried me along. When you flap your wings to stretch yourself, it might seem small to you, but you change the world with everything you do. So he stretched his wings and took off from the safety of his tree. And the butterfly finally saw the sea. I remember mom would make my lunches Every afternoon when I was five Sandwiches and carrot sticks in bunches It's strange how certain memories survive We'd both sit on a kitchen stool I'd tell her what I did in school How I'd carry on People carry on When you're a kid Your world becomes your parents I saw them like a movie in my mind Dad was George and Mom was just like Clarence I became the two of them combined Then one day our family Was suddenly just dad and me But we would carry on People carry on Time went by We changed and grew I bounced back like children do and Mom was always close to me Her robe was like her legacy I felt like she was woven there in every stitch and quilted square Reminding me of things the way they were But sometimes distant memories can blur I knew my mother's robe But somehow I'd forgotten I remember lemonade and lunches Laid out like refreshment set up wrong Sandwiches and carrot sticks in bunches I was six the day they buried mom My 
borrowed tie, the perfumed air, the flower baskets everywhere. Every triviality is locked inside my memory. Details will survive the years, while mom just slowly disappears. But people carry on. People carry on. People carry on. Here's a question I like to ask. Have you ever met your idols or heroes? Yeah. It was the coolest thing about moving to New York and living there was that you that suddenly it sort of sort of validates what you're doing, first of all, when you're a writer and you're living outside of New York, you feel like a weirdo. But I remember we sublet an apartment in New York, and I was early on when we were there, I was riding the elevator down with our dog, taking the dog for a walk, and um, talking to the guy in the elevator about dogs and he has a dog, he has a place upstate and he keeps a dog there and I left the elevator and I looked up and it was Stephen Schwartz and it was just like one of those cool moments where you just thought these people are like around me, I thought they lived in a building protected with a moat and a barking dog but they're like in and then I had this great opportunity Lynn Aarons and Steve Flaherty invited me to be part of the Dramatist Guild Fellowship which was an incredible experience for me and I became I, I worked with them for a couple of years on shows of theirs as their assistant and um uh, you know, Richard Maltby, who we'd listened to growing up with Closer Than Ever and Miss Saigon and just all these iconic musicals that were part of our DNA. And uh, he directed our show on Broadway, The Story of My Life. Like, these people suddenly became part of my life, and it was amazing to meet heroes. But I think the one you're leading towards is... We, when we were working on Bed, Dumps, and Broomsticks, we met with Disney, and they sent us out to uh, meet... Richard Sherman, one of the Sherman brothers, who was the uh, one of the, the they were the songwriters on Bad Noms and Broomsticks and Mary Poppins and bajillions of other things that again just feel like they're part of my DNA. And we were there and uh, like one of those pinch me moments of your life where you're in the, Richard Sherman's living room and he's playing demos, the cut songs from Bad Noms and Broomsticks and dancing around while his Oscar teeters on the mantle. And you're like, yeah, that's gonna fall. And it was just incredible and and. Um, and all these people are just like ridiculously nice people and, and so eager to pass on knowledge and information to a, a new generation of writers and it's so great to feel like you're, we're part of this evolution of what's going on. Anyway, so Bedknobs and Broomsticks, the cool thing about that is that, is that we get to use the original Sherman Brothers music but I get to write new songs as well in that style which is crazy hard because it's deceptively simple. I mean those are simple songs but they, they do so much and yet, you know, as you can tell I write a lot of words um, and so that it's really a good exercise to kind of pare that down and become a simpler writer in the style of those guys. Um, so this is a song actually that I wrote full on for the for Bed Noms and Broomsticks, the musical. If you remember the movie at all, you might remember that Roddy McDowell appears in the movie and he's third build, but for some reason he has like eight minutes of screen time. I think he got cut out of the movie for some reason. But we've restored that character. Uh, he's more much more prominent in the in the musical, and he has. Um, He's essentially our antagonist to um, the her heroine in the movie who's played by Angela Lansbury. And so he's the sanctimonious parson of the town. Um, so who better to sing that than Brian Hill? <laughs> the sanctimonious It still has a lot of words, Neil Bartram. It does. Okay. Um, so are you ready? And uh, we, the best part about this is that uh, one of the other characters who's also in the movie, uh, Mrs. Hobday, the postmistress, played by Tessie O'Shea in the movie, um, uh, I get to play that in this, the Scottish postmistress. Be ready for it's it. worth it. Hear me, it's worth the price of admission just to hear my <laughs> Scottish accent. Okay. As a leader of this community, it is my duty to remain alert. Every citizen of Pepperinjai is at the forefront of my mind as we strive to weather this national crisis. In this time of gross injustices, one must maintain control, and that's where, dear Mrs. Hobday, I come in. You see, a war, to put it mildly, can take a moral toll, and one scarcely even knows where to begin. 
wolf is come a-knocking. He's right outside our gate, and he threatens our bucolic neighborhood. I must provide this town with guidance before it gets too late. It's my duty for the greater good. Oh, Mr. Jelkins, a miracle pepper and jai has survived these last five centuries without you. I promote, dear Mrs. Hobday, the parochial ideal. I help my flock avoid a steep, corrupted cliff. I am the quintessence of decorum. In spite of this ordeal, my upper lip, you see, is never less than stiff. If I see someone who's veering from the narrow and the straight, I intervene as any decent person would. One must swoop in for the rescue. One must not procrastinate. It's essential for the greater good. Now, poor Miss Price, I fear, may be a target. For this scoundrel, this strange Professor Brown, she's been bewitched, unhitched, and mesmerized. Her moral compass is clearly upside down. She needs a hand to guide her towards salvation, a friendly beacon that calls her from the sea. She needs a righteous cornerstone for those endless nights alone. She needs a pillar, a staunch companion. She needs me. You, Mr. Jelk. Indeed, my good woman. Don't you see? Miss Price's redemption is a symbol. I do this for England, for Churchill, for the King. Rule Britannia, Mrs. Hobday. England shall never surrender. So say it with me, Mrs. Hobday. Say it with me if you dare. We've all been told we must keep calm and carry on. But there are times one must take action, and there's no time left to spare. One must take charge before the moment's come and gone. These are desperate times indeed. One may feel victimized by fate, but one must rise above. It must be understood. This is war, dear Mrs. Hobday. This is war. There's no debate. A woman's life hangs in the balance. Not to mention her estate. Why don't I take this letter to her? There's no need for her to wait. I'm on a mission for the greater good. Oh, Mr. Jelk, your patriotism is inspiring. You must enlist at once. Alas, if only I could, my, um, Quincy, you know. The Beginning, a story about Alvin Kelby. My mom passed away in the summer I turned six and left a single father and his son. But dad had the bookstore with a leaky roof to fix, so I was on my own, facing the unknown, the terrifying prospect of grade one. But at the time, how was I to see? A kind and gentle soul was waiting there for me. Mrs. Remington, our first grade teacher, made elementary school a better place. But her single most disturbing feature was the coarse black hair on her face. Well, maybe she was menopausal, lack of estrogen will cause a lot of odd conditions, some acute. The irony would never face her namesake of a famous razor and to be so facially her suit. But Mrs. Remington smiled and she could brighten my day. Back then, a teacher hugged you to make you feel okay. And though my face sort of stung from Mrs. Remington's beard, when she held me, my problems disappeared. Mrs. Lynch was an ignoramus. Mr. Pollock was just plain mean. Mrs. Remington was nearly famous for her parties at Halloween. Pumpkin heads of every shape were cut out of construction paper. Each and every one would be displayed. The highlight for the children was to make a really special costume for the yearly Halloween parade. Mrs. Remington smiled, and she was clearly content as she lovingly presided over this, the main event. So we'd nervously walk past her critical eyes, and we'd vie for Mrs. Remington's top prize. There was this one kid wearing cardboard wings, a coat hanger halo, carrying a bell, and a homemade book that said Tom Sawyer. No one had a clue what he was supposed to be, except me. Mrs. Remington, I know. Pamela Koshan thought he was the Statue of Liberty. Mrs. Remington, I know. Donnie Carter thought he was a Thanksgiving turkey. Mrs. Remington, I know. He's Clarence the Angel from It's a Wonderful Life. He was my mother's favorite. The class laughed. I cried. And Mrs. Remington announced that I was next. But Mrs. Remington smiled in that way that she had. A 
the smile that made you realize that things were not so bad and I knew from her face that this feeling would pass so I went to take my turn before the class well, those poor kids were still trying to figure out who the heck Clarence was when I shuffled onto the platform in fuzzy slippers and bathrobe with pink sponge curlers in my hair Alvin Kelby Mrs. Remington said and what are you supposed to be I'm a ghost the ghost of my mother. Lunch that day was awful lonely, sitting by myself and only wearing fuzzy slippers and chenille. While all the kids were making fun, in came Mrs. Remington, with Clarence dragging slowly on her heel. Clarence, she said, I'd like you to meet Mrs. Kelby. She's a big fan of yours. And Mrs. Remington smiled, cause Mrs. Remington knew That the battlefield of childhood was easier with two Mrs. Remington watched as the angels do And on Halloween that year, she saw two masks disappear When my mother met her angel, and I met you What's that one from? That's also from the story of my life. Should I, should I tell my story at, at security before we go into the last song? Yes. So I'm at security this morning. I went to an early flight this morning to come here. And um, there's nobody at security. So the, TS, the TSA guy starts chatting to me. And he said, uh, where are you off to today, sir? I said, I'm going to Washington. The state or D.C.? And I said, Washington, D.C. Um, what brings you to Washington, D.C. today, sir? And I said, well, and I could hear this in my head before it's coming out. I said, well, I'm... I'm doing a concert at the Kennedy Center. The Kennedy Center? Are you a musician? Yeah. Uh, what do you play? Well, I play piano and sing songs that I wrote. He goes, what's your name? Neil Bartram. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said Michael Buble. <laughs> right? should have said Michael Buble. So uh, this is our last song. Again, one, one more time, a huge thank you to the Kennedy Center for having us here and uh, for Michael, for, to Michael for um, inviting me to be a part of this great series. This last song is also from The Theory of Relativity, right? It is. I never really liked apples, though heaven knows I tried. Cause it's just weird to hate apples So for years and years I lied I never really liked apples It's not a choice per se I don't know why I guess that I was simply born this way I never really liked apples Though I grew up in Spokane where all they've done is grow apples since the day the world began. So I hid my feelings for apples. It's a skill I learned to hone. And as I grew, I guess I knew I'd always be alone. But I've always liked oranges from my earliest memories. Even though there's no orange trees in Washington State. Still I liked oranges, it's an urge I was shy to admit. To me apples were apples, but oranges were it. Well, I left home and the apples, I had passions to pursue. I started my own adventure and enrolled at NYU. I was shy and minded my business. Then I met Mike one day. He seemed so nice, so I broke the ice and found the nerve to say, I've always liked oranges. I'm sorry, oh my God. I've always liked oranges. What a strange conversation start. He said, dude, here's the strangest part. I like oranges too. 
We're two guys who like oranges Who were sent a clear message by fate We don't have to like apples Oranges are great That moment left quite an impression That moment a light bulb went off I remembered the years of repression And my worries that people would scoff All those times that I tried liking apples Seemed at once like a meaningless waste And I learned there with Mike That you like what you like And there's just no accounting for taste Now we're proud to like oranges And we walk with our heads held high Because I found another guy Who loves the things that I love And so did I We both love oranges He's so handsome And he's awfully cute If you're looking for morals We'll give it a shot There are those who like apples And those who do not So whatever your preference Embrace what you've got It's a big world Find your favorite fruit Thank you very much, everybody.